Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the open session of uh, the Fairview District 72 Board of Education meeting. It is October 20th, 2021. Apologies that we're a few minutes late starting. Thank you, Drew. Okay, uh, we have already established that uh, we have a quorum present. Um, so I would just like to remind everyone uh, to please silence your cell phones and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag Thank you. Uh, Right, so our first item of business this evening is to approve the minutes of the regular and closed session meetings of September 22nd, 2021. Can I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. Okay, are there any questions about the minutes? Or changes? No? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. The minutes are approved. So next item is to approve the payment of bills in the amount of $276,531.85. Can I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Okay. Are there any questions about the bills? Hearing none, in that case, would the secretary please call the roll call vote? Uh, Ms. Bujdi? Yes. Ms. Diakakis? Yes. I vote yes. Ms. Downing? Yes. Mr. Guliana? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Okay. The bills will be paid. Um, so, next item is um, PTA report. Do we have any representative of the PTA to make a report? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Stephen Ladenas, one of the PTA co-presidents. Uh, we wanted to announce that our new um, and improved PTA webpage is up and running. Um, it can be accessed just like the other, the previous one through the Fairview uh, webpage, clicking on families and then PTA. And then we hope to keep that up to date and have all the PTA information posted there for easy access for all the families. Um, but we'll continue to send out our weekly PTA newsletters, which we've been doing this year to keep families informed of specific events that are coming up. Um, we held our second uh, PTA benefit night last night at Lumel Nadi's, and we have our third PTA benefit night coming up Thursday, November 4th at Village Inn Pizzeria in downtown Skokie, um, where if you mention that it's part of the PTA fundraiser, the PTA gets a portion of the proceeds from that night. Um, our PTA Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee is hosting their first event next week um, on Wednesday, October 27th, where Dr. Lawana Wells, CEO of Wells Equity and Chief Equity Officer of Niles West Township or Niles Township 219 is presenting a one hour webinar titled Closing the Divide from 7.30 to 8.30 via Zoom. Uh, we're encouraging parents to sign up um, so they can get the, the Zoom link um, to that for that meeting. And then our room parents and guardians are currently working hard on preparing fun games and activities for all the K-4 students for Friday, October 29th for the Halloween parties as well as the fall party. Uh, for safety reasons, the parents will not be in the building for that event. So we're prepare, preparing everything for the teachers. Um, and then we're also preparing for our PTA Halloween trunk or treat, which is taking place on Saturday, October 30th from 2 to 4 p.m. in the Fairview South rear parking lot, along with participating in one of four 30 minute costume walks. Students and their families are invited to participate in pumpkin carving and pumpkin craft competitions by bringing in their completed works of art prior to 2 p.m. to be eligible to win some fun prizes. And then finally, our next general PTA meeting will be held on November 10th at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom, and the link will be provided in the weeks to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to administrative reports. And our first report this evening, we have some special guests. You want to take it? 
We do. Um, I would love to introduce uh, Mrs. Carly Gross, the Director of Special Education here at Fairview, as well as Mrs. Taryn Kendrick, who is the Director of NTDSC, um, the Niles Township District for Special Education Cooperative that we are a member of. So ladies, come on up. I think we have your presentation ready to roll. So welcome. Um, Please feel free to remove your masks while you're presenting. We are comfortable with that and we know it's hard to present under a mask. So uh, welcome. Thank you for being here this evening. You want to check? I'm not very tall. So. Good. You want to? No, I would say hello. Hi, good evening. Um, like Cindy said, I'm Carly Gross, the Director of Student Services here at Fairview. Um, I've been at Fairview for 15 years. This is year 16 for me, and I feel very lucky to be part of the Fairview family. I wanted to thank you for having me tonight and appreciate your time this evening. So special education is um, governed by federal law known as IDEA, or Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Under IDEA, school districts are legally required to provide specially designed instruction at no cost to families to meet the unique needs of a child with a disability. IDEA ensures that all children receive FAPE, which is a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment, also known as LRE. In other words, eligible students are provided with specialized instruction and or supports to address their academic needs in their least restrictive environment. The least restrictive environment, as discussed from the previous slide, refers to the federal law that requires students with disabilities to receive their education to the maximum extent appropriate with non-disabled peers, and each child's LRE is different. This upside down triangle is different or opposite to that MTSS or RTI triangle that we'll talk about later, and the, when we, um, we'll talk about that later. Um, the triangle focuses on special education and the least restrictive environment when discussing a student's placement. The largest part of the triangle, so this top part right here, is where most of our students are educated. As we go down the triangle, most of our students um, with IEPs are in that third and fourth section of the triangle. And as we go further, the bottom portion of the triangle represents placements for our students with more specific and specialized needs. This is more often our low incident population of students with disabilities. So this first section of that triangle refers to general education with no supplementary aids or services. This is the largest part of our triangle. Most of our students fall within this section of the triangle. These students are progressing appropriately with their tier one instruction and are being provided by um, that core instruction through their core teacher or general ed teacher or core teachers. They receive their instruction from that core curriculum and they're progressing without needing additional supports or services. The second portion of that triangle refers to those students that require just a little bit more than that tier one alone. Although this is still part of general education, these students may require some academic or behavioral supports. This is where the school's MTSS process comes into play. So MTSS, also known as RTI, or Response to Intervention, is a comprehensive, evidence-based approach for effectively integrating multiple systems and services to simultaneously address students' academic achievement, behavior, and social-emotional well-being. Students can be referred to the MTSS team in various ways, including teacher referral, universal screening, which is our MAP or FASTBIDGE benchmarking. And that is our main way that we identify these students in need. Once a student is brought up through the MTSS process, their progress is reviewed and supports accommodations or more significant differentiated instruction may be discussed as options for that student. If tiered intervention is recommended, the student's progress is monitored regularly. Examples of some of those supports could include reading support, math support, social worker counseling, 
Sometimes we have OT, which is our occupational therapy, speech therapy, as short term for through RTI services to see if a child responding, 504 plans, classroom or school accommodations, or behavior incentive plans. When we look at our academic tiered support for reading and math, our goal is to get as close to that RTI triangle as possible, where 80% of our students are in tier one. In pulling our data, we are really proud to report that our district is right there. Of course, because of the COVID slide, we've had to make some adjustments to criteria for intervention. And because of that, the district has added some supplemental supports to our tier one in hopes of hitting more students. This chart identifies the percentage of students K through eight in each tier. We have also been piloting something we call tier one plus in our K through four, where our interventionists are helping teachers provide more targeted supports in the classroom for those students who may need a little extra, something extra, but not yet tier two. The next section of our LRE triangle refers to resource support, where students receive special education services for less than half of their day. Since IEPs are individualized to each student's unique needs, every student's program may look different. Therefore, Fairview offers a variety of services. Some of these include, push and support, where a special education teacher provides specialized instruction within the general education environment, pull out support, where a special education teacher works in a small group in that special education setting, consultation support, so a special education may also work with general education teachers to make sure that the child's needs are being met within um, the general education setting, and lastly, some students are eligible for what we call speech and language IEPs, where support is mainly provided by a speech and language pathologist. The next portion of the triangle refers to instructional or self-contained. This is typically when students are in a special education classroom for more than half of their day. Fairview currently houses K through four instructional opportunities within our building. Typically, these students receive the majority of their services in the instructional or special education classroom. Fairview has historically partnered with East Prairie School for early childhood programming, as well as instructional level support. The model that has been developed includes supporting early childhood at East Prairie School, supporting instructional programming K-4 here at Fairview, and supporting instructional programming 5-8 at EPS, East Prairie. Over the years, the way in which Fairview has supported programming five through eight has evolved and continues to evolve. Currently at the fifth grade level, as we move to that middle school model, the team looks at student needs class by class. If a child is able to integrate into general education, requiring pullout services for core academics, such as math, reading, or ELA, the student will likely have a placement opportunity here at Fairview. Depending on their level of academic or functional needs, and if a student requires more of that special education home base, the team might then look towards East Prairie for programming. Furthermore, moving through that continuum of support and services, if a student were to require more than that or more extensive support, the team might then look towards NTDSC. Additionally, since IEPs are individualized to student need, we find that we have many students who kind of float between that third and fourth section of the triangle, which is that resource and instructional. Good evening, everyone. I'm Taryn, and I am the executive director at Niles Township District for Special Education. And I've been with um, NTDSC as the executive director for 15 years and um, with NTDSC for 18. Um, Today, um, Carly and I, when we discussed um, this presentation, we really felt the triangle would be a good opportunity to show how we partner together. So when you looked at, when she discussed really those first three tiers that um, where the majority of your students here at Fairview are educated, how NTDSC supports those tiers is really through our purchase services. And that would be occupational therapy, physical therapy, our coaching support. So those types of services um, that, are really an a la carte model that your district can decide, you know, this is, these are the students that um, we are able to educate within Fairview, but we do need some support and that's where NTDSC can jump in and partner. Then as you move down the triangle further, as Carly mentioned, um, some of those um, more in, uh, instructional or self-contained model, NTDSC also hosts those classrooms. So currently we have 22 satellite classrooms within Niles Township and um, those are, those classrooms 
are in all different districts and I'll show you that in a minute. And we educate children from early childhood through age 22. And 14 um, 70, District 72 students are within our satellite locations. And really, I think sometimes it's hard to understand what makes an NTDSC classroom maybe different than a Fairview K-4 classroom or an East Prairie classroom. And what I try to explain to, um, what I, when I try to explain this, I really think of it as the learning that takes place is just, it's just a, a different type of instruction. So it's very systematic and it's very individualized. So um, perhaps the students that are in your K-4 instructional classroom may have similar tasks that they're working on. They may be at a similar level. They may be, be, may be below grade level, but it may be at a similar level of their peers. Whereas in an NTDSC room, that might look very different. Our focus is really on skill development rather than curriculum modification. So we really look at curriculum that is right for that one particular child. Our programs have a very systematic approach to them, which is unique to the students that we service that really have the most intensive needs. Um, teaching, the teaching is very directed and often scripted. The other thing that's pretty unique about our um, program is that our related services, so our speech pathologists, our occupational therapists, they are, um, we have a push-in model, so it's 100% push-in. The kids, the therapists are within the classroom so that then when they leave, that it can be carried over throughout that day. Um, and unlike a general education setting where the students are, the, the therapists are often servicing kids um, K to eight, our therapists are spending about a half a day in each of our classrooms so they can really um, help provide that intensive therapy as well as that carryover to the other adults that are within the classroom setting. The other thing is, um, our, our classrooms also work on those life skills. And what I say about that is our functional life skills, things that our students can then learn in the classroom, generalize in a gen general education setting, and then hopefully take out into their community. So when you're looking at the different instructional type of classrooms, that's really the difference between maybe a Fairview and East Prairie and an NTDSC program. Then as we move further down the triangle, we are looking at a separate um, special education day school. We're very fortunate in Niles Township to have that within our township. We have the Malloy Education Center. It is unique. It's a public therapeutic day school. There are multiple private therapeutic day schools, um, not right in our backyard, but um, within you know, 20 to 40 minutes. But Malloy is unique. And we currently have four District 72 students within Malloy. And that is, when we think about um, the size of your school district, that is really, you're about right exactly where you should be. And, um, and that typically is how, um, in the years I've been working with Fairview, oh, sure, I'm sorry. In the years that I have been working with Fairview, um, that, that really has been um, pretty steady numbers, um, the satellite students and the Malloy students. The other, um, as I mentioned, the private therapeutic day schools, those we don't have any within Niles Township, but we do have students that, that attend their private therapeutic day schools. Currently, there are not any District 72 students that attend outside of our township. As you move further on the continuum, we do have um, the, the most restrictive options is a residential treatment center. And within Niles Township, we only have two students that are within residential treatment centers, nobody that's from District 72. And then we also offer home hospital instruction if a student was to need that as part of their IEP. Niles Township, so I wanna give a little history or a little information about who we are. We are a special education cooperative and we've been in existence since 1957. And um, the Malloy Education Center has been in existence since 1969. We service all of our elementary districts that feed into District 219, so 67 through 74. And I always say 73 and a half in there because that makes up the nine districts. We did a financial restructuring in 2012 that really holds true today. Our um, business managers meet on a regular basis and review our financial structure. And what we set in place in 2012 really still continues to meet the needs of our districts today. Uh, it, the uh, membership services and the purchase services were really the areas of our focus. And the purchase services is really directed at individual districts to make decisions that best meet their needs. And that was something that all the districts agreed that we really needed to put into our model. 
We are governed by articles of agreement. And most recently, um, we've had the articles of agreement in effect since 2015, and they still, again, hold true today. Here are some of the ways we partner with NTDSC and District 72. So if you look on the left, these are the supports that we provide. This is generally in our membership services. So we do provide um, legal guidance and support with state mandates. We provide networking opportunities. Our IEP system is within Niles. All of the districts in Niles Township use the same IEP system, which really helps because we do have students that move um, from district to district. And it also is one that's widely used throughout the state. So that is very helpful. We have uniformity with our paperwork, our programming, our benchmarking and our assessments. We provide funding oversight for the IDEA grants and compliance with federal and state reporting. Something new to all of us is the Early Childhood Alliance, and that is NTDSC is the fiscal agent for the Alliance, and we've been working together to really bring early childhood opportunities to our township. We have, um, re we do a lot with the special education research-based curriculum and really work with our districts to make sure that they have robust curriculum in special education. And then we also provide our districts access to specialists. So that's what's really unique about NTDSC is our, um, all of the districts have speech and language pathologists, but the ones at NTDSC have a very specific focus with that low incidence population. Some of the services that we directly partner with District 72 was be our instructional programs that we've already talked about. The purchase services, um, you currently purchase occupational therapist from us, a vision itinerant, a hearing itinerant, an instructional coach, and a physical therapist. Um, I am the state approved director of special education for all nine districts. Um, we do provide professional learning, parent education. We do the ESY programming. Something that um, the non-public schools were required to provide a portion of our IDEA grant to our, our non-public schools and NTDSC oversees that and provides those services. We do our preschool screening and we also have an assistive technology coordinator that supports our district. So those are just some of the ways that you can see how we partner with your district. Here's where our satellite locations are. Our newest location is in District 219. So just something to note, District 219 is not a member district. They are, um, they have not been a member district since I've been on board. I think they, it was 2005 when they went off on their own. And, um, but we've still worked very closely with District 219. Uh, we are, um, we have a renovation in the process at Malloy, which I'm sure you, you're well aware of, and we have run out of space. So District 219 was very gracious. Their new Bridges Center, it's a transition center. They offered us a classroom there for our high school, our high school students, who of course are out of district students, many of them are theirs, but we are running a classroom there at no cost. So we're very excited to be partnering with District 219 in that endeavor. And here's um, the classrooms that we have at the Malloy Education Center. We have 18 classrooms at the Malloy Education Center, and we span from pre-K through 12th grade there as well. Here's just a little bit, uh, kind of it consolidates a slide. Oh, I don't know, it's still right here. <laughs> Thank you. So as I mentioned before, the instructional program at NTDSC, we have four students from District 72 at Molloy and 14 students in our satellite locations that does include early childhood. And those are the services that you currently purchase from us, occupational therapy, physical therapy, coaching, and non-public services. And I think before I mentioned vision and hearing, you have purchased those in the past, but you don't have any students that are receiving those services currently. So this graph represents the percentage of students with IEPs compared to those without IEPs within the district. Just to point out um, that this percentage can appear a little higher due to the number of early childhood students that we have within the district with IEPs. Currently, the district has 14 preschool age students that are identified and receiving services. Legally, we are obligated to identify and provide services for children aged three to five that live within our district boundaries. However, since we don't currently have a general education preschool, those 14 preschoolers are the only preschool students that are currently enrolled in the district. Sure. 
Yeah, and so historically compared to the state average, we're right where um, the state is. And we're pretty consistent historically where, um, where our numbers are. This pie graph identifies the percentage of District 72 students who are serviced outside of the district. So this includes students who are attending the programs at East Prairie and NTDC in Malloy. Currently, we have 3.9 students of our overall general population of students attending um, in District 72 outside of the district, where 96.1% of our students are serviced here at Fairview. And lastly, um, this last pie graph breaks down the service locations for the District 72 students with IEPs. Um, most of the students with IEPs are serviced here at Fairview. 73.4% of those students are here. 10.1% of the students are at East Prairie, um, but most of those are for early childhood little friends. 12.8% um, of the students are serviced through NTDSC. Um, and lastly, 3.7% um, are currently attending prog programs at Malloy. No, that was a lot of information. Do you have any questions? I have, I have a couple questions. Can you go back one? Um, Here? Yeah, this one. So the orange where it says their service through NTDSC, does that mean? Yeah, satellite class, sorry. Satellite the satellite classes, classes okay. versus Malloy. Gotcha, it's gotcha. all NTDSC, but NTDSC satellite. Satellite, yes. got it, okay. And just out of curiosity, on the upside down triangle, um, I didn't see anything in there about like paraprofessionals. Can they, if a student has a paraprofessional, do they go up or down in LRE? Doesn't matter. It depends. It could be wherever in the triangle. It depends if it's an I, if it's for um, which purposes. So we have, you know, um, paraprofessionals that work with general education students. Okay. Um, and that might be supplementary aids and services, but we might have a paraprofessional that's, you know, working solely with a student with an IEP to work on their individual. Are satellites set up for different needs or is it more on a district or location um, need? So they are all set up with different needs. So it, we, we call them cross-categorical classrooms. But for instance, our Lincolnwood campus, we have um, three classrooms on Lincolnwood's campus. And the majority of our students that are on that campus have deaf and hard of hearing needs. But that's not, and then we do have a few other locations that might be more specialized for students that have more um, behavioral issues. But for the most part, we would say the majority of our programs are cross-categorical, and we have a few um, unique ones in there that are really specified for certain needs. Presumably, that changes as, as the you know, intake of student changes, as they grow in and out of the school years. Absolutely. So for instance, right now at East Prairie, we have two classrooms there, and we had one before, and we it was the K-2, and then as the kids got older, we made that classroom. We didn't want the kids to move, so we moved the teachers. Mm -hmm. And so then that, that could change the makeup, you know, that could change the classroom, that could change the makeup of whether you move the kids or you move the teacher. And so, yes, as, as we move through, that can change. And that's why our, our number one goal when we do placement for students is proximity to their home. Mm -hmm. So we really look at that first and foremost. And um, then we also then look at the program. Does a child have a deaf and hard of, uh, need with deaf and hard of hearing? Or does a child have some behaviors that really re require a certain teacher? And so th those are the things that we then look at. But proximity is usually the first thing we look at. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Are the satellites um, locations just categorized like you said, or why isn't it at each district? It depends on who has space for us. And that's how, so we, we've been in District 72 before, but you have grown a lot. And I know that there's talks about bringing us back when you do have your addition, which we would, we would be thrilled to come back. Being in a K-8 building is great for us because it does allow students to stay um, because we can, they can grow and we can grow with them. So that, that would be a great opportunity. So it really truly is space. Every year I'm asking, and that usually is what it comes down to is who has space available to us. And just so to give you an idea, 
when I um, started this role in 2007, we only had nine satellite classrooms and we were at Fairview at that time. We've went up to 22 this year. Um, prior to this year, um, last year we were at 20 classrooms. So we increased by two this school year. So our satellites are growing, which is great because that really talks about the LRE, trying to keep kids in their least restrictive environment and being in a general education setting really is one of the, the, the things that we look at. And I, and I guess that, sorry, that, that had to do with my question as well. Um, so I noticed that Fairview wasn't on the list. I'm glad to hear that they were. I hope with the new uh, remodel that we can bring you back. Um, if we had a NTDSE classroom here, would the pie chart change with the yellow section? How would those students be? So if those students are here at Fairview in the NTDSE, are they still in that yellow section or do they move over to the blue section? They would stay in the yellow section. So even for state reporting, it's a great question. Even if they're in their home school, but in an NTDSE classroom, they're still not considered in their home school necessarily when we report to the state. So there's some extra kind of extra steps we have to take, which can be frustrating because the state doesn't look at them as, you know, they're just looking at numbers, they're in locations. And so then we have to explain, well, this is their home school and this is how it, you know, this is how it works. Um, and we've never had an issue um, with compliance with location of students, but that would be a consideration that we would have to really explain our case. So it's a good question. Um, you talked about the percentage of students um, in your program versus students overall throughout all the district. Um, so has that percentage increased? Is that one of the reasons that you now have 22 satellites instead of the nine? Or is it just more that the entire student population has increased overall? So that is a great question. So when we looked at this, not this past year, but the year before, we had increased students, NTDSE had increased students by 25%, and the districts had, they, in overall, in all nine districts, there was a decrease by 2%. So we wow. were seeing more students, but in some of our districts, we're seeing an increase in mm -hmm. enrollment, but when others were seeing a decrease overall, it was kind of flat, but NTDSE had seen a 25% increase in students in 2019. So it, that, that's, that's one of the big reasons high. about Malloy and I, and I didn't get to say thank you to your board for approving mm -hmm. our construction project, but that is one of the main reasons that um, Malloy is, we're needing an expansion to. Well, I think it just shows that, um, you know, us as a district, we're, you know, required to, as you explained at the beginning, accommodate whatever child is in our district and whatever their needs are. And so that can um, be considerable investment on our part as a, as a district. But um, we're very, very grateful to have such wonderful services available to us in various different guises, obviously um, completely individual to the student, which is brilliant. And um, I would say if anyone new to the board in particular uh, would like to, I'm, I'm inviting them to your school. I hope that's okay. I was going to do that too. <laughs> I, I actually did take a tour of NTDSE, uh, uh, Malloy, I should say, um, a few years ago, and it is amazing. Just the facility that they have there, and it's about to be ten times better. Um, but the, what you do for your students there is just absolutely mind blowing. It's amazing. Well, and Taryn is um, too humble to probably say it, but I will. Um, this Niles Township is known for providing excellent special education programming for students. Yes. Many times we hear parents moving into the district mm -hmm. who have child children with special needs. And they've done all the research, you know, they're looking for the best programs. And I think that's, um, you know, attributable to Taryn and her leadership, as well as the staff she has working um, both in the satellite programs and at Malloy. Um, people move to this area for those programs. So I think that's why that's you're 25%. <laughs> And I think, thank you, Cindy, for saying that, but I also think it's the partnerships we have with our districts. And that is, you know, Fairview is such a gem of a district being KA. You have less than 800 students and you really have such a personalized district here. But when you have that, it would be almost impossible to meet the needs of every single individual child. So by being a member of a cooperative and a partner with a cooperative, 
you're able to do that in a much more efficient and effective manner. And no one likes to say that we, we can't meet the needs of a student, but I think that that's a hard thing for a team to come to terms with when, and I can say that Carly sitting next to me as the leader of her, of her teams, that's hard to say, you know, we have to look for another placement, but that's what I hope we're able to do is provide a, a strong, solid placement where you can look to us and say, we're, we need some help and we have a good partner that can do it. And then also purchasing services from us and bringing good people in that can support your programs and help grow your programs, because that is our ultimate goal. We, if, we, if, I, if you could tell me every student could be in their home school, that would be my goal too. But we know that that's not always possible. So how can we support one another? And that's really what I think is so key to a strong cooperative is these strong partnerships with our districts. Is this available for the community or parents to view? I mean, it helped answer a lot of questions that I had. Yeah, um, I, I would be happy to post it on our website. I um, yeah. wanted to have Taryn and Carly, you know, provide the presentation and give the background and the context to the slides, but we can definitely post that and I can send it out to the board as well. Okay. And you Hi. are all welcome to come and visit. Malloy. I just we had one more. Have, it's not even a question, but you know, I'm never, I'm never gonna not talk about this issue. So um, I just wanna reiterate that like, I will advocate that we, have NTDSE in at Fairview as soon as we have the space to do so. I will continually push for that. But what that also means is that we could take kids from other of the nine districts to our building, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I love the idea that the kids in these programs um, kind of get to go between districts. I know it's hard on families, but from a kid's perspective, when you get to high school and you see a friend that's been in your building but may not live in your neighborhood, that's huge. So I just think the more we can bring kids and support the satellite here, and once we have the space to do so, we will try and do that. Um, so I've seen the program go into high school. Um, and as an educator, I look at what you guys do with a fine tooth comb and, and it's, it is one of the best models. Um, and I think our kids are, are happy. So we're gonna keep supporting that. Thanks. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions or comments? Well, I just want to thank you again for coming this evening. Um, I, I have heard from you before on your presentation. I knew some of what you presented this evening, but I swear I always learn more about NTDSE because it's always changing. That's the thing. It's always morphing into different things. And the number one reason for that is that you're accommodating every single child. So you are doing a fabulous job. Uh, we're extremely grateful for you for coming this evening and uh, we'll continue doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, um, should we move on with the reports and we should get back? Okay, um, moving on to uh, the second administrative report, which is from our superintendent. Yes, thank you. And I know Carly and Taryn, you don't have to stay. <laughs> now is a great opportunity if you'd like to head home. I know you both have had long days, so. Um, yeah, just a couple of highlights from the superintendent's report. Um, we um, are continuing to work to um, smooth out the shield testing process in school. The first several weeks were uh, fairly rough um, and staffing was an issue, um, but this week has been much better. Um, and for those of you who are parents in the audience or at the board table, um, you are certainly aware that we have had some uh, students test positive who are asymptomatic, which is really the point of the shield testing to try to catch those students. So we'll be working with their families going forward to continue their learning. Uh, we had a facility forum on finances um, to discuss the potential building projects on October 12th. Um, we did receive a couple of um, emails and phone calls from some members of the public who missed the meeting, and um, we will certainly be looking to 
place another meeting um, you know, in the coming weeks, um, or Jeff and I are happy to meet with members of the public who might have missed the meeting and go through the presentation on a more individual basis as well. Um, we had a wonderful Institute Day on uh, October, I think it was October 10th. Um, all of our staff um, had CPR training, whether it was their initial or the refresher. Um, so not only um, did they have CPR, but the Heimlich um, and how to use the AEDs, which we are required to have in school buildings. So um, it's something I feel is really important to have our staff 100% trained in case there is an emergency in the building, whether it be a student or a colleague or an adult visiting. Um, we also had the opportunity for our staff to have a um, personal tour of the Skokie Public Library. I felt it was very important for all of our staff members, um, many of which who don't reside in Skokie, to have an opportunity to go through the library and learn of all the wonderful resources um, available to our families and to them as educators in Skokie. Um, we all um, are granted Skokie Public Library cards. Um, so every um, teacher in Skokie uh, can utilize the services of the library. Um, so that was an excellent, excellent day. Um, Jeff and I continue to meet with Archon and Associates to discuss the master facility plan and the various projects that are under consideration, continuing to try to fine tune those plans. Uh, we will be coming to the November board meeting along with the architects, along with uh, Elizabeth Hennessy from Raymond James to talk about financing. And at that meeting, the board will be asked to make a final decision about the direction of those projects and how it will be funded by the district. Um, so that's coming up in November. Um, let's see. The last thing I would mention, um, we also have scheduled for the November board meeting, Dr. Yvette Dubiel, who will be um, presenting to the board the outcomes of the equity audit. Um, with that, we will also be proposing next steps um, in terms of the work that we would like to begin um, and continue uh, following that board meeting. So we're excited to have that coming up. Um, and other than that, uh, it's just been a very busy time of year. Uh, we are really trying to balance the needs of our staff in that, you know, we are still in a pandemic. Uh, we are still working through the issues of students coming back into the building for the first time in some time. Um, you know, the social emotional needs of our students who have um, suffered losses of different types. Um, but balancing that with trying to continue to move the district forward. Um, you know, we have a very aggressive strategic plan um, you know, we won't be able to accomplish everything that we had on the docket um, for the coming years because of the pandemic and because we've had to slow down a little, but we're really trying to balance not overworking our staff <laughs> and asking too much um, because they do a lot. And in a small district, you might have heard me say this before, we uh, all wear many hats. And so everybody's on a committee, everybody's doing something uh, a little bit extra. And um, this year, although we're closer to being back to normal, we're not quite there yet. So we're trying to be very considerate of that and balancing out what we're asking of our staff. So if there's any questions that I can answer, I'd be happy to do so uh, at this time. Everybody good? Great. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so moving along, we have the um, IASB resolutions discussion. Um, there is quite a lot, bit to get through on this, but I'll, I'll try and work it as easily as we can. Um, I think you all just received the hard copies of the resolutions. They just came in the other day. Um, to the benefit of the uh, new board members in particular, the way that this works is every year at the conference, there is a delegate assembly and I'll be the delegate, um, I have been for several years. Um, so I'll be re representing this board and I will be voting on these resolutions. The resolutions come from various districts up and down the state. Anyone can put forward a resolution. They go to a resolutions committee and they decide which ones actually get to this stage of, of uh, being at the uh, delegate discussion in November. Um, the way that the, the flow chart I, I gave you, it just sort of shows um, the process of each 
uh, of the resolutions, there's basically two categories that they determined as a committee, an IASB resolution committee, they are going to adopt the resolution that they think that it's worthy and they will actually proceed with it or they do not adopt it and they do not want to proceed with it. And when I say proceed with it, all that really means is that IESB as an organization will pursue that with legislators in order to get legislation passed to support that particular resolution and the, and the purpose of it, the proposal. So it's not to say that, you know, as soon as I vote with all the other delegates in November, that's it, that, that happens. It's just the start of the process really. Um, the IASB will then begin working with legislators and other groups and so on to, to work towards a, le a legislative solution. So the reason for my flowchart was just to bear this in mind, the do adopt resolutions are usually placed on a consent agenda unless somebody at the delegate assembly asks for it to be removed because they want to debate it and discuss it. So the consent agenda is all voted on and if they are voted on positively, which they usually are because they're in the consent agenda, those become part of the positions of IASB. If they're taken out, then they're debated and then voted on. And then obviously if the vote is positive, it also becomes part of the positions of IASB. On the do not resol adopt resolutions, they're automatically, in a sense, you know, on the scrap heap. They're, they're, they're not to be adopted unless one of uh, the, the proposing school district appeals it. And in that case, that would actually happen by a deadline before the delegate assembly. Um, even at that stage, it doesn't necessarily that it's going to get voted on to be approved or not approved. It gets voted on to see if it should be debated first. Um, and then if it passes that, then it gets debated and voted on and potentially becomes part of the positions of IASB. So I hope that that would actually help you as we're working through this, because you will see that there are do adopt resolutions and do not adopt resolutions. And that is the designation of the IASB resolution committee. Um, so we do need to run through these and the decision I need this evening to take to this delegate assembly is whether you want me to agree with the do adopt or disagree with the do adopt and actually oppose it. And the same with the, with the others. Um, if it's a do not adopt and you want to adopt it, I can only do that if that school has forwarded that um, appeal and I won't know that until I actually get to the delegate assembly. So in a sense, on the do not adopt, if, we, if we're in favor of it, it could be moot because if it's not been appealed, then it won't even come up for vote anyway. Do you see what I mean? I know this is quite complicated and believe me, it's taken ooh, 10 years to get, to get the grips with it. But if we could just run through them, because uh, there is quite a lot this year to, to get a decision on. Um, so first of all is uh, a resolution for pre-service uh, teacher education to include um, instruction on literacy so that teachers should um, take at least one education course solely dedicated to uh, reading instruction. This has been voted by the committee to adopt. There was a similar one like this, this time last year, only this one is a little bit more specific if you wanna read it down. So like I say, basically at this point, we have to decide, do I also say yes, do adopt, or do I say no, don't adopt? Around the table, yeses or noes? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay, so that's a yes. Second one is student safety and some protection plan, um, which this has come up several times in the last year um, and it's morphed slightly at different times. It essentially is allowing school districts employees, um, if they have the proper firearm owner's identification to be able to carry a firearm, a concealed firearm in schools. It has come up several times in the last few years and it's always been voted down because people don't want to see guns in schools. Um, the emphasis on this one 
is that it is purely voluntary and it's purely local control and it's a purely a decision of each and individual district. The main arguments for this from these particularly remote districts is that the response time for the emergency services is often considerable. I mean, ours is literally up the road. They could be 20 minutes away. Um, and as I say, in past years, this has been voted down every time. And the recommendation from the committee has been do not adopt every time. This year, they actually have said do adopt. And I think it's because I don't know whether they've just relented or um, they're actually uh, feeling that uh, the emphasis on choice means that it, it is literally up to every single district in the country to decide whether they want to do this or not, and by no means any obligation. So again, do you want me to go with the recommendation of do adopt, or would you prefer me to say do not adopt? I think I, I personally would say uh, do not adopt. I know this was something that came up last year, it was, uh, yeah. and, and we were against it. We didn't feel that this was um, was 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 the right thing for our school and for our district. Um, and, and I guess part of me feels that it's a little bit of a slippery slope. And if it gets opened up in one place, even if it's by choice, um, then then more pressure can be put to continue to expand it. Um, and, and I personally don't want to see any guns in schools ever. So well, good memory for remembering it came yeah. up last year. Um, so I would say my personal vote would be to not adopt. Okay, I agree with Aaron. I would oppose. Okay, thanks. I'm Aaron. opposed as well. Opposed. Do You're not. Opposed. Okay. Um, I also oppose it. Um, that is a, a majority of five of us right now. So I, I looks like I'm opposing it. I agree. Okay. All right, that's a no. So next one is board member compensation. This also has come up every couple of years. And uh, it also has been blocked. I know it sounds stupid, doesn't it? We're potentially blocking our own pay. The consistent response from people is that um, it's a slippery slope. Again, if you start paying districts, then, I mean, some, some states do pay their school members school board members i think it's about five states if you google it that do pay board members um but they're most often very very big districts like in florida where they have literally hundreds of schools within the district and it's somebody's full-time job so uh so what does iasb recommend they are saying do not adopt so do you agree with me do not adopt or do you want me to oppose that yeah, do not do adopt. Not, do not adopt. Do not That's adopt. what I agree. All right. I'm sorry there's so many. There really is a lot more this year than normally. Normally it's about six or seven, but now there's like 14. Um, board member child care reimbursement. This is kind of an extension from that, really, that, that if board members themselves wouldn't be paid, that there would be some kind of compensation for board members um for child care so that they are able to attend the meetings that they're required to on this one um the committee did say adopt so okay. so it's saying that if i need child care for me to be a board member here tonight and somebody at home that i would be compensated for that child care yeah that's the principle of it i mean i i think it also i mean they're saying oh you know well uh, it's a barrier to people joining the board. Well, there's lots and lots of barriers to people joining a board. I mean, you could have a job that is in the evening. So guess what? You can never be on the board. So, I mean, it, 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 I think you could potentially be completely overcompensating all the time. But then again, there are other, I'm just trying to put the flip side is that there are some school districts that are desperate for board members. And so any kind of compensation would, would actually be welcome. But. Yes. You do? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so the next one really pertains to what we were dealing with during COVID um, uh, in the early days of COVID, I should say, 
in that, that there should be a permanent remote virtual op option for school board meetings. Um, obviously everything would uh, uh, be in line with the Open Meetings Act. Um, and there still would need to be all the usual public comment or availability for public comment, et cetera. But so everything else would be the same. It just would be having the option at any point in time to switch to a remote um, meeting setup. And this is a do adopt. Yeah, I would support that. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. We did it before we can do it again. Uh, the next one is about reorganization of the board. Basically, every time there is an election, uh, there is a certain period of time, I think it's 21 days before the election results can be uh, set, determined, whatever the word is. Um, and then that allows um, just seven days before that board has to be sworn in. So if you think back to when you guys were sworn in, we had to do it within 28 days of the election day. This is saying that that's too tight um, and that there, it should be extended to 40 days. Um, the pros of that obviously is it gives you flexibility, but the, the con, if you like, is that you could potentially have this sort of lame duck um, board that are still sitting on the board. They know they're not gonna be continuing, that they could pass things that, that people might not agree with. I, I personally think that's like, I don't know. I, I I can't see people jumping all over that and saying, "Oh, great, we're on our way out. Let's get this in now." You know, I don't know. Certainly not here. We wouldn't. Um, this is being recommended to adopt by by ISB. Any particular thoughts? I I think yeah. Assume best intentions. I I agree. And, uh, yeah. Adopt. And so extra time would be helpful. And all, like I said before, this is only about. IESB taking up this as a cause. It doesn't mean it's going to switch from 28 to 40 days. They may come to some kind of compromise in between like 35 or something like that. I don't know. But um, so that's a yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, indigenous people curriculum in inclusion. This um, is a recommendation that there be, uh, I have some notes, uh, that that particular area of instruction, uh, specific instruction on, on um, curriculum inclusion is missing from the current US history requirements and that they want that to be included. Yes, adopt. Yes. Uh, yeah, they, they were rec recommended to adopt on that one. Are we good on that? Mm -hmm. uh, next one is the science of reading curriculum. Uh, this is for Illinois to introduce the science of reading, that's in inverted commas, as in it's a specific product, in their K-5 to grade level curriculum, which includes in-depth phonemic education. Uh, this one is actually being uh, recommended as do not adopt, and the main reason for that is that they're saying it's too specific because it's too focused on this particular science of reading, as opposed to being, yes, we should do more for helping kids read in school, but not that that this particular program should be mandated. I, I agree with that one. Yeah, they should, yeah. So we agree, we should oppose it. Okay, next one is health and sex education curriculum in schools. Um, this is a change of language. Although Senate Bill 0818 currently states school district may rather than shall use curriculum, we have concerns that state legislators will change it to shall. So they want to be ensured that they keep it as may. Do you see what I mean? It's a bit confusing, but they want to ensure that any any health and sex education curriculum is is a local control. This is saying that the district has control of what we're teaching when it comes to sex ed. If you read it down, it's that we firmly this is the district speaking. We firmly believe in a local district's right to determine the curriculum that best suits their community and students that they serve. Local school board is the elected representative of the school board community and understands the thoughts and wishes of those that live there. 
no, that's the district that proposed this. That's not us. No, no, this is um, Mercer district. So this one they are recommending do adopt. Do. So they recommend to, to adopt to just keep it at a local. It means keeping it as may instead of shall, because the shall is more a mandate. May is you do what you want to do. I have one more question. Can I look up the SB0818 if that's the one that I'm thinking about? You want to check it out? Is that the one that they wanted to start sex ed in kindergarten? I don't I so. recall. I, I thought it was the same as DB. I, I don't recall without looking it up, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, if you do want to check this out, we have another meeting before I go to the delegate in okay. November. So we could put a question mark next to this one if you want to check it out a little bit more. Please. And then you can give me some instruction over this next month when you've yes, researched it. Okay, that's fine. Okay, we're getting through them. Uh, cannabis sales, woohoo, not in schools. Um, it was, the proposal is that 20% um, of the tax revenues from cannabis sales be put to public education to support youth development. The, the committee said, yes, we should do this. But one of the things that they actually added to it is that this should be supplemental and not supplanting. In other words, it should be in addition to whatever money we get at the moment, not saying, oh, well, you know, you've got the drug money, we'll just drop your state funding, you know? Yeah. So yes, I think if there's more money, we'll take it. Agreed? Yes. Yeah. Everybody's nodding. Okay, clean energy infrastructure federal funding. Um, this is uh, allowing proposal to allow campuses, school campuses, I'm sorry, sorry um, uh, to be candidates for clean energy. Uh, interestingly, this is a do not adopt. So only if the school proposed it, the proposed it submits an appeal, will it actually come up for discussion? But should it come up for discussion, do you want me to vote positively for this? The actual result, uh, resolution is that um, uh, Illinois the, uh, Association of School Boards should urge Congress to provide federal funding to school districts for clean energy infrastructure, including but not limited to solar panels, geothermal heating, cooling, and wind turbines. I, I say yes, personally. I don't agree with the committee. But as I say, it only comes into play if there is an, uh, an appeal filed. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, I think we're all for clean energy. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think th the reason they're saying don't adopt is it might wipe out any federal cuts that a school gets currently. So they're saying, but we're already doing solar panels and now we're gonna lose it if this thing passes because it's only from here on out. So that's just one to look at. But if yeah. ISA, a, IASB has like a bigger picture of it. So if they say do not adopt, they're probably looking at the bigger picture rather than I guess. just that school. Do you want to come back to that one? Yeah. We'll come back to that one. Okay. Uh, electric school buses, we're on the alternative energies again. Um, electric school buses and charging sta stations. This one is also recommended to do not adopt. So again, it, it will only come up if it's been appealed. Um, but this is uh, to urge Congress to provide federal funding to school districts for clean electric school buses and charging stations. So um, this is the objection really was that this is just talking about electric buses rather than other clean burning fuel. Um, I know at 219 they invested in natural gas, didn't they? So um, there are alternatives. So they're saying, as it stands, with it being just a focus on electric, they're saying, do not adopt. Mm -hmm. Agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Landscaping federal funding. Uh, this is, now this is actually quite interesting. Have you read this one? This is for 
to provide funding for school districts that are dealing with the effects of environmental problems, including flooding. Yes, we know all about flooding. Um, so it would be to provide fund funding to allow for stormwater detentions, trees, perennial plants, root structures, and uh, just all kinds of things that will actually help those structural problems that the schools are facing. And this is recommended as do adopt. Yeah. 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 And um, I, I guess I, I don't quite understand why they're okay with federal funding for landscaping, but not yeah. for energy infrastructure. I was um, a bit confused too. I, 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 so I, I think both of those seem yeah. related. Uh, I get the electric so buses being too specific, yeah. but the other one I'm, I'm not so sure of. So I, I would definitely support. Okay. Um, next is expanding broadband internet access. Uh, duh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for being facetious, but yes. And the next one, I think this is the last one, isn't it? Yeah, this is the last one, um, which is about child safe gun storage. This also came up last year. Um, this is about having a recommendation that at the moment the law is that if there is a person uh, under the age of 14 in a, in a household, then a firearm needs to be locked um, to change that law to 18. So basically to capture those um, kids between the age of 14 or 18, that they also, it would be, uh, the access to the firearm would be removed for them. This did come up in 2020 and it was recommended then to do not adopt. Nothing to do with it in principle, it's just more that this is not a school board matter. This is not something that is in the purview. The, the, the school board could support this, but we can't tell people what to do in their homes. It's, it's, not, it's not to do with the school district. It's to do with people's choice in the homes. So that was the reason they said last year, do not adopt. Um, and this year, they're also saying do not adopt. And, and like I say, I. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Do not adopt. It, I agree it doesn't have the, anything to do with the school. Yeah. The, it's, the determination is here is it's not the place of school boards or IASB to determine the actions people take in their own homes. Do we want kids to access guns? Absolutely not. But it's all about what is in the purview and realm of, of a school board. So I I would agree with do not adopt. I, I'm okay with going with their recommendation, which is to do not adopt because it's not in our purview. And that's it. Um, after that, there is a whole bunch of other information there, which is all the previous edition uh, um, positions that they've taken. So feel free to take a look through those. Uh, that's usually done in a one block vote at the end that we, um, adopt those continuing um, and sometimes there's this one that's being slightly amended but but that doesn't tend to change terribly so thank you we just have a couple then that i've marked that we'll just reconvene on i mean we may not even come to it next meeting if you want to just take a look and give me your opinion between now and next month um, I'll probably have a conversation with Shireen in the next week or so and get her point on these and report to her what we discussed this evening, um, or she can watch the video, um, just, just to get her opinion. And uh, I think we've got a good position. Thank you. Thank you for helping me work through that. I know it's kind of complicated, but uh, we are done. Okay, and hang on a minute. I need to switch. Um, so, as far as the um, second reading of the board policies, uh, we went through those last month. They were also in the packet for this month. When we went through them all last month, there really wasn't anything much of a change. There was just some language changes, and most of them were five-year reviews. I didn't feel, personally, that I didn't feel there was any questions I wanted to raise, but I'm very happy to to um, open it up if anybody's got any questions about any of them in particular that they're concerned about. No, I, I, I thought not. I mean, they're very, very straightforward. So 
that made life easier. So we will be uh, voting on that as an action item at the end of the meeting. Okay, so moving on to board committees and representatives. Oh my God, it's still me. Um, Ed Red. So I did go to the Ed Red lunch on September 24th. Well, I, I virtually attended the lunch. Um, uh, it was very, very well attended, which actually made me quite glad that I didn't attend it in person because it was kind of crowded in there. Um, but at the Ed Red lunch, that was when Ram Villabalam addressed everybody with his plans for this coming year, the, the particular things that he's working on. Um, Edred also outlined their initiatives for the next year. Uh, they're focusing on property tax issues um, like uh, TIF and PTEL, which are the, uh, TIF is the tax relief for uh, improving blighted areas. There's a big sort of decision about what constitutes a, bl a blighted area. And PTEL is obviously more important to us because that's about the tax caps, which we're subject to. Um, there's also professional development mandates uh, that they're looking at at the moment. There are numerous mandates uh, determining uh, the professional development that all teachers must take um, periodically. Uh, there's a move to try and streamline that and make it more manageable. Um, and that's actually something that um, Senator Villavalam is working on with Ed Red. Um, there's the Amendment of the Firearms Restraints Order Act. Uh, this is currently that only family members and law enforcement officers are qualified to file um, a restraining order to remove a firearm from a person. Um, this is looking to extend, uh, uh, draft legislation would extend that to a school district, not that the school district would actually determine if the person had the firearm removed but but simply petition to do so if they thought that there was a concern they could petition and then obviously a judge would decide whether that was petition was acceptable or not uh, they're working on that there's also working on special education funding structure um, there is a high cost special education funding commission report that's coming out in november so they're going to be looking at that. It overviews the entire special education um, funding structure. They have advisory committees on equity, finance, early literacy, and social emotional learning. Um, I have actually put forward to be part of their equity committee because I've done extensive um, training now on equity. I just did one this afternoon. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that my experience of doing those will bring something to their advisory committee. Um, I don't know if Jeff's still doing the finance, is he? All right, okay. Nevertheless, we'll be involved in something somewhere. Um, and then the ad hoc committees, um, they're looking at professional development and also zoning um and communications with with districts so they're pretty busy they, they outlined what they're going to be working on this year so i'll be attending the meetings as i can and um i'll be reporting back on what legislation comes out of these efforts okie doke oh, i get to take a break and pass over to nora to give us a report on NTDSE. I got nothing because our meeting is. Oh, yeah, in you two said. Weeks. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot you said that earlier. No worries. So you had no meeting, so there's nothing to report. Okay. In that case, Diana. Steve was here and kind of gave the update earlier. I wasn't able to attend the last meeting. Okay. So we're good. We're good. We're good. Okay. Wow, now we are steaming through this. Uh, let me get over to am I on the right page here? Okay. Yeah. Um, freedom of information requests is next. I can note that there were uh, no FOIA requests received in this last month. Um, information items and correspondence. Mr. Secretary, do we have anything? Uh, it's since uh, our last board meeting, uh, there have been no correspondence oh. this month. Nothing? Yes. Good. 
And now we approach public comment, um, where we can invite the members of the audience to address the board, um, ask them to state their name, and we will be keeping a three minute time limit. Uh, the secretary will do so. Um, I should also add that um, our provision for getting uh, comments to the board online, there were no online comments this month. So we will just be dealing with anybody who wants to address the board um, in the audience right now. Anyone? Okay, so finally, we're getting to our action items. Um, well, not finally, but close to finally. Um, so our first action item this evening um, is to approve employment of personnel as was discussed in our closed session meeting earlier this evening. So can I have a motion and a second to approve employment of personnel? So moved. I'll uh, second. Okay. Could the secretary please call the roll? Uh, yes, Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Diakakis? Yes. Mr. Guliana? Yes. Ms. Downing? Yes. I vote yes. Ms. Bougie? Yes. Excellent. And uh, our second action item is to approve the board policies. I won't list them because there's too many. Um, the board policies as listed in the packet. Uh, can I have a motion and a second? So moved. I'll second. I think board policies, we'd actually don't need a roll call vote. We can just vote. Voice, vote. voice vote. Yeah. yeah, it's got roll call here, but it's not. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. We have approved the board policies. So items for future consideration. Does anybody have anything to put forward? I just want to say I do realize that I skipped an item <laughs> right at the beginning. <laughs> oh, good news. I, uh, I skipped it. I'm sorry. So again, I think I will we'll combine in the sense then that uh, anybody got any good news and anybody got any items for future consideration? In regards to good news, I'd like to congratulate Fairview Administration with the niche, niche rating that they had. They were number one in um, and a Cook County rating and a public in Illinois as well. So that was absolutely congratulations. Well yeah. done. Mm -hmm. I had the uh, opportunity to attend the uh, I think it's the Little Nine uh, volleyball uh, tournament that was hosted here oh, at Fairview. Yeah. I think it was a great event that brought the community together and and the Fairview girls uh, did very very well uh, both the JV and the varsity team. So congratulations to. Uh, Fairview uh, girls volleyball team and, and their coaches. I know, I apologize. Oh, West. <laughs> Yay. Excellent. Yeah, I apologize for, for skipping it, but then I thought, okay, we'll just do it all at the end. So um, everybody has at their desk, at their place, a little pin. Uh, this is actually our um, uh, recognition um, as a, a oh, I've forgotten what it's actually called now, but the school board recognition award that, that we received as being a Governance award, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yes, so I have three of these now. 
I do. I have a lot of pins. <laughs> so, yeah, so well done us. Um, I think that's it. Is there any other food, food items? Nope. Okay, in that case, can I have a motion and second to adjourn the meeting at 8.24 p.m.? So moved. I'll second. Can the secretary please call the roll? Uh, yes, Ms. Fuji. Yes. Uh, Mr. Guliano. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Ms. Diakakis. Yes. I vote yes. Ms. Downing. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank mm -hmm. you.